How do you find meaning in life? It's mostly a question that we've all asked ourselves at some point or another in our lifetimes. And it's a question I wondered about countless times when I was growing up as a teenager. I think that there are many ways in which we can find purpose to one's life through means that could be philosophical, spiritual, religious, or even cultural. But personally, as a teenager, I wondered, could we use science as a means to find one's purpose in life? And you might be wondering, why science out of everything that you could pursue, why use science to find one's meaning in life? And to understand this reasoning, it's important to realize that science itself is actually a method that has yielded some really incredible things over its existence. Science relies on two principles, that ideas can be testable and that there is data that is present to support these ideas. And this simple method has yielded an incredible wealth of innovation and discovery from eradicating disease to sending people into space and so much more in between. If science is so powerful in transforming our lives, would science be equally useful in finding one's purpose? And as I realized, science can lead to some really interesting interpretations of how we can live meaningfully. But you might realize that science can lead us into some logical traps. And there are two traps that I want to discuss with you before moving on to what science really offers in terms of finding meaning in our life. The first trap that science tends, or that science seems to offer, is the trap of materialism. Because in science, everything has to be physical, has to be material. Things that are immaterial, things like spirit, the soul, human imagination, spirituality, character, these things that make us human are just simply not recognized by science. If you dig one step further, science says that we are all made up of particles, of atoms, and atoms themselves don't have any sense, don't have any purpose in their existence other than just simply being there. The same atoms that make up you and me are the same atoms that make up a bookshelf or an object down the street or anything. So basically, science seems to suggest that we're all living in a completely absurd world and in addition to this, that one day we might simply cease to exist. And I found this really frightening and very uneasy as an interpretation. And I thought to myself, well, this might not be so bad because in the end we still might be able to you know, make decisions that are reflective to ourselves and to really enjoy life. But then, if you dig one step further, science offers a second trap. The illusion of free will. Free will is basically the capacity that allows a person to consciously make decisions. And from a scientific perspective, free will must come in what is called human consciousness, which is the collection of human thoughts, decisions, and everything that happens at the level of the human mind. Science says that consciousness stems from the human brain. And the human brain itself is made up of billions and billions of neurons, which are specialized cells whose role is to carry on these electrical signals, to take electrical signals from some neurons and pass them forward. And if you were to know the exact location of every single electrical signal in the human brain at a given time, then you could mathematically predict how these signals propagate forward at any given point in the future. And this raises some problems because if you can determine the exact firing pattern, the exact propagation of these electrical signals in these neurons, then you can predict what one person will think about. And the issue is that if you can predict what a person will think about, you can also predict what a person is going to choose. And this means that basically we have no control over any free thought, any, over any free decision, because all of our decisions tend to be predetermined by firing rates, by firing patterns of neurons in our brains. And these two traps, when put together, 
offer a very frightening and somewhat unsettling view. A view that suggests that there is no meaning to our life. And in addition to that, it's as if we were just living through a movie, being living uncontrolled, uh, being unable to change the course of our actions. And this troubled me a lot. But then the thing is, if you dig one step further, you realize that these two traps are not necessarily true. And science can actually offer a very promising and fulfilling vision of what it means to live. I call these the three principles of science. The first principle involves being in admiration of the beauty of our existence. The second principle is about being open to new discoveries, to what we call paradigm shifts. And the third principle is about knowing where we're headed as a civilization. Let's start with the first one, the principle of being in admiration of our everyday lives. According to science, Earth is one of the very few places in the universe that can support life. Most of the universe consist, consists of empty space that is very hostile to any form of life as we know it. So our blue planet, a small planet orbiting a medium-sized star among billions and billions of stars, is truly like a small oasis in an endless desert. So life itself is precious, now everyday life, our everyday activities are really something that are really something that follows nothing short of a miracle. And when you take this one step further, when you think about how we came to be, science says that humans, you and me alike, are the result of four billion years of evolution. From the first life form known to exist, likely a unicellular organism, going through billions and billions of years of changes, of trial and error to morph into more and more sophisticated and intelligent life beings until finally coming to humans, the modern, modern day humans, as we see over here. And every day when you wake up and look around you, you really are at the intersection of what is a true miracle and beauty on the grandest scale possible. And it's our duty to ensure that we can protect this really rare condition, these rare set of circumstances that allow life to flourish. So already, science convinces us to have a profound sense of admiration towards everyday life. And now to the second principle, the principle of being open to possibilities. Until the mid 20th century, people would think that science would be a linear, uh, continuous culmination of knowledge. So basically people thought science would be everybody contributing a bit, scientists over the years contributing their bit of knowledge, and we'd have a really smooth collection of facts of how the universe works. But in the early 1960s, a physicist by the name of Thomas Kuhn suggested a radically different idea the idea of paradigm shifts. And instead of having these continuous, uh, this continuous progression of knowledge, Kuhn's idea was that they would, you would have these individuals who would cause these scientific revolutions that would completely um, push scientists to rethink about a certain field. These scientific revolutions would shake the foundations of what scientific knowledge was perceived at the time. And a famous example of a scientific revolution would be the advent of quantum physics. Quantum mechanics studies atoms, particles, at the very small scale. And when scientists started researching and coming up with theories that resulted in quantum physics, they had to rethink a lot of things, things that classical physics could not explain, or uh, possibilities that classical physics wouldn't, wouldn't allow, such as teleportation, or spins of electrons, and many so other, many different things. And I think the same can be said about the study of human consciousness. Perhaps we're on the verge of a scientific revolution, of a paradigm shift that would radically rethink how human consciousness, free will, and the brain are interwined. So it's possible that free will could exist 
from a scientific perspective. And this really teaches us to, to be open to new discovery, to be unafraid to challenge the status quo, and to always be out there getting ready to explore new possibilities and to better understand how the world works. The third and final principle that science offers in finding meaning in life is that it kind of it can predict where we're headed towards as a civilization. In the mid-20th century, Russian uh, astrophysicist Nikolai Kandashev wondered, how can we classify civilizations? And Kardashev believed that likely the best way to do so would be to measure the energy consumption of a civilization. He classified civilizations into three types. Type 1 would correspond to a species that's capable of extracting all of the energy resources that fall upon a planet. A Type 2 civilization would be able to harness all of the power of a nearby star. And a Type 3 civilization would be able to harness all of the energy that is produced by an entire galaxy. When you try to rank humans on the Kardashev scale, it's quite funny because we don't actually we actually don't even reach type 1 status. And this led astrophysicist Carl Sagan to suggest the creation of a new type category, the type 0 civilization, which would be reflective of humanity during most of our existence as gatherers consuming only most readily available resources, like wood, trees, and food, and things that are uh, within reach for manual labor. Today, humanity ranks at approximately at a 0 0.7 civilization status, and it's possible that within our lifetimes, we'll be able to achieve type 1 status, based on our current energy consumption and technological development. I think it's crucial that we need to achieve type 1 status if we are to ensure the survival of our species. And it's really that once you achieve type 1 status, it's likely that humanity would somehow have garnered the technology that's required to distribute all this energy. And you have, if you have such technology that's available, you likely also have technology that would be um, available to allow every human being to enjoy adequate resources that would guarantee a standard quality of living. A type 1 civilization would also likely have a form of government that could ensure the continuity, the stability of such energy consumption, and this would require a government that is much more responsive and responsible of every person's individual rights. A type 1 civilization basically ensures the survival, the long-term survival of humanity. And to get there, we need to face many, many challenges that are very, very pressing today. There are a lot of them, just, just to name a few. Climate change, inclusivity and fighting discrimination. Governments that are more, need to be more responsive of individual rights and concerns. The rising inequality, the rising disparities in wealth and the regulation of, of recent and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and nuclear power, there are a plethora of challenges that are emerging that we can play an active role in solving. And science says that if we want to ensure a long-term survival, a long-term continuity to humanity, then we need to address these challenges that we can, in which we can make a concrete impact. If we return to the initial question, how can we use science to find meaning in life? The answer is quite beautiful. There are pitfalls that we need to avoid. But once you avoid these pitfalls, the answer you get is that science teaches us to enjoy, to be in admiration of the beautiful universe that we live in. To take care of one another. To be in service to be open to new discoveries and new interpretations. And most importantly, science teaches us that we can actively contribute to solve challenges around us all the time in order to ensure a better tomorrow, to ensure the survival of humanity. Should we use science to find meaning in life? Absolutely. 
Science tells us that it's important that every day when we wake up, that we should take actions to contribute to society in order to make a humanity that's much more safer, diverse, more advanced, and most importantly, much more inclusive to everyone. Thank you.